what a pleasure it is hey. to be in this historic setting, addressing one of the most urgent matters of our times. Of course, today we will be talking about whether artificial intelligence is a creative threat or a boundless blessing. And one thing is certain, as we know, creativity is going to look fundamentally and radically different, even in the hour from which we emerge from this session with our incredible panelists. As you very well know, we have writers in Hollywood and novelists around the world who are horrified about how their work is being used to train AI. And there's outrage in music as Spotify debuts a new AI DJ and the Grammy jury considers a new AI-generated track. On the other hand, septuagenarian artist David Sally told me that he is absolutely happily training AI to paint like him, appreciating that, of course, the AI will outlive him and just get better and better with time. <laughs> will I Am, not to be confused with Will Gompertz, uh, is another <laughs> tremendous advocate, and he suggests that the AI boom is actually creating a new creative renaissance. Now, with us to explore how imagination and creativity can thrive in the digital age, we have three illustrious panelists. We have with us Yoncha Dervi Shoglu, who is Google's Vice President of Marketing for Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and serves on the board of Caring. Her boyfriend is one of those outraged novelists, Erlen Kage, and she works for a company that has had two of the world's best AI research labs integrated in what is now, of course, known as DeepMind. As well, Google has an arts and culture unit that has digitized most of the world's great artworks online. With Yansha, we have Will Gompertz. And of course, author, broadcaster, and critic, Will is currently the artistic director of the Barbican Art Center and will soon become the new director of the John Soan Museum. He is the first ever arts editor of the BBC and has written so many books about art that he has fundamentally explained to our nation the difference between Manet and Monet. <laughs> so we are incredibly grateful for that. Albert Reed needs no introduction. He has launched and led businesses for Condé Nast in the UK and across Europe and Asia for decades. A former journalist, he has written for The Spectator, TLS, Telegraph and The Times. Most excitingly, this year, to great acclaim, he has published The Imagination Muscle, which explores the genesis of ideas from arts to sciences with the aim of helping us better understand our own imagination muscles and how we can exercise them over time. Now, before we get into the deeper topics, I have a very quick fire round of questions just so we can gauge the starting point of where you're at. Very quickly, starting from Yancha, do you think we are born creative? Yes or no? Yes. Will? Emphatically, yes. Albert? Definitely, yes. <sighs> Let's try to get some more dissent on the question <laughs> of, is imagination a muscle that we can develop? Yancha? Uh, yes, absolutely. So I didn't hear the question. <laughs> is imagination I I was and hearing? Can I just tell you what I was thinking about? We were outside. This is just a little reveal. And... and <laughs> Jana works for Chanel, and Chanel are part of the people who have helped put this whole amazing event together, in fact. Will, where's this going? You're breaking the rules. <laughs> so, so we have so, And Yoncha has an Yves Saint Laurent handbag. Oh, no. And do you know what happens? From We're walking in. It's, bra it's brand new. It's brand new. Snapped into. Will, is imagination <laughs> a muscle into. we can develop? <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, sorry. Um, so you don't is want it, people to think I have yes, evil eyes. Yes, it's definitely an imagination. Yes, you can develop it, yeah. And Albert. Yeah, what do you think? Yes. <laughs> okay, is AI a threat? No. And yes, both. Okay. Getting better, Will? Yes. AI is a threat? Yes. And Albert? Uh, it's a threat and it's an opportunity. Terrific. Well, I am very much looking forward to unpacking that. On that note, I would love for each of you to briefly define creativity, starting with Albert. Well, I would def uh, let me define... And imagination. Imagination. In very simple terms, I would define the imagination as to see what is not already there. And I would then subdivide it into three categories. Imagination is... Ima you imagine as you breathe. You think, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? That is the first layer of imagination. The second layer of imagination is this idea of making connections, the Pegasus imagination, as I call it in the book, which is really the, the vast realms of what we, what we typically think of as the imagination. And that is 
humour, that is making connections, that is putting together a thriller, that is the, the politicians making connections in, 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 in government. And then the third le level of imagination is really the highest realm of imagination, the what I call fusion, and what Samuel Taylor Coleridge described as the imagination that dissolves, diffuses and dissipates in order to recreate. And that, that's a type of imagination which I think it sits at the very summit of imagination and creativity. And that's something that we can talk about a bit later. But that, for me, is... That's, the question is, will, will AI get to that point, is really the, the question that I'm, I'm asking. I love how you liken that in the book to the Prometheus level of fire. Yes. And I guess extending from Albert Einstein saying, logic will get you from A to B, imagination will get you everywhere. Extending the question to Will in terms of defining creativity, imagination, how you see it. I think, simply put, it's the ability to ask a brilliant question, um, which requires an imagination. But I think what we have, which makes us, what, what makes us human is our imagination, in a way. It's, it's our defining characteristic over any other species, and certainly over any other machine, is this ability to step out of time and place. So we could be here, but I could be thinking about something completely different in the same time and place, to have an idea, to conceive of something, and then realize that idea, which is just the most extraordinary ability. So I could be sitting here talking to you, also thinking about sending a text, send a text which got some jokes in it, and jokes take a great deal of imagination with a recipe, and somebody can go and make it down at the other end. That requires such a huge breadth of neural connections and the ability to react to what you're thinking and feeling inside, feelings as soul, which machines don't have, um, that I can't imagine any other um, species or any other machine being able to replicate that ability to step out of time and place, have an idea, and realize it. Jan, does that resonate with you? It Creativity, does. imagination? It does. I mean, I guess I'm very ill-equipped in a room of creatives and on a, such a panel to talk about creativity and imagination, so I'll do it in my sort of geeky way, which is what I see people and technology and how that really expands their imagination and they can go anywhere. For example, there was recently a man in Japan using Google Earth and he cycled 4,000 miles to spell marry me for his girlfriend, which he captured with a GPS tracker. And I was just like, you can Google it, it's there. And then there is, of course, this Kenyan javelin thrower who just gets to a certain level with his javelin throwing, but not Olympic level. And he gets stuck and he doesn't have, it's not a big thing, you know, it's not an Olympic sport in Kenya. So he goes on YouTube and realizes he, he needs to also work certain muscles and builds himself and ends up in the Olympics. So for me, AI, or in this case, YouTube or Google Earth, are just tools and it's people using those tools that's really imaginative and creative. And as Darren Allman, this friend of mine, a contemporary artist said, the medium, uh, he said, sorry, bear with me, it's the, the, the medium is, ne the medium never transcends the artist. The artist always transcends the medium. That's how I think about it, about all this technology and people. It's the people, it's the artists, it's the people at the center. But use that technology, use the latest technology to be creative. I'd love to come back to where those good ideas come from. And being recently in Silicon Valley and Mountain View with Google, I sneakily checked into BARD to check whether AI is a threat to creativity. So I posed this question to Bard. Um, and what I loved from your um, large um, language model engine that it came up with and said, there is no need to fear AI because AI can actually boost your creativity. And so I thought that was a lovely humility and also a companionship in terms of the machine <laughs> accompanying the creator. Um, and so what I'd love to do just to unpack for this audience as well is what is different in terms of the acceleration? Why are there so many debates and discussions since the launch of ChatGPT, Bard most recently? What is it about this exponential AI that is particularly concerning or exciting for creators? Yeah. So my, uh, the way I feel about AI is the way my daughter puts it, which is literally, she was uh, 12, I think, when she said, I'm nervous-sighted about something she was going to do. Nervous-sighted. Nervous-sighted. That's how I feel. Now, Matt, uh, he's my partner at Google. Um, he heads up Google Europe, Middle East, Africa. He told me he was at a lunch with a policymaker, 
and the, the policymaker showed his fork to Matt and said, I can stab you with this, or I can use it to eat my food without getting my hands dirty. And I think it was a great analogy to every technology, and I can see how AI, of course, is much more advanced than, than uh, a fork. So it can be uh, ner making people nervous, and it should be. So I want to just tell you two things, which is one is the way we think about AI is as Google, we need to be bold and responsible together. Bold is the innovation part. I'll skip that for now. But responsible is, I'll unpack that. And together, I'll unpack that. So responsible is, what do we do as Google? So one is, in 2018, uh, we published our AI principles. We were the first to do that. There are things like uh, uh, look out for safety, uh, societal safety. Um, don't build weapons that mass harm, harm people at mass. Uh, look out for bias. You can Google them and they're all there. So we developed the AI principles. We have an AI council. For example, we knew we had facial recognition technology, again, back as early as 2018. We obviously didn't deploy it. Same goes for um, lip reading. Somebody with an Im hearing impaired, an engineer with a hearing impaired family, said, look, we can lip read uh, with AI. But again, you, know, you can imagine the mass surveillance uh, uses of that. So there are certain technologies that we don't release because we know they will be harmful. So that's the AI principles and the AI council. And then um, there are products we develop. Like for deep fakes, we have something called, um, we just launched that, digital watermarking. So you'll know that there will be a watermark that you can tell whether a video is original or fake or not or uh, metadata for texts. And then we just launched, again, Google Extended, which is a publisher can say, I want to opt out of my site being used to train Google's AI model. So we have lots and lots of uh, products. And then the together part is um, we have something called News Guys, so bold and responsible together. So together with publishers, for example, we have News Geist, which is an annual uh, gathering of us and pu top publishers, hearing from them their concerns, sharing with them what's coming up. We have roundtables. So I think the together, and then Sundar's quote is the one I'll end on, is with regulators. AI is too important not to regulate, and it's too important not to regulate well. So we have to do things together well with policymakers. And I think that policymaker point is so interesting just in terms of regulation be innovation. I think there's so much discussion in terms of America and Europe, uh, in terms of what European regulation will do to American more freestyle innovation. Um, with that said, I'd love to hear I, from I was just going to say, I, I think coming from a media business, from Condé Nast, the, 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 the threat of AI to digital media is, is, is profound in a way that search wasn't. Because we, with, with search, we, we, we would do a, a deal with Google. We allow Google, to, Google spiders to crawl the digital content that we serve in exchange for people reading our pages, and we can serve advertising, and we can sell subscriptions. And so if you search for an article on the, U on the Ukraine in the New Yorker, you get taken to the New Yorker page, and you get an advert or you get a subscription offer. And that was a value to the publisher. But with, with AI, you type into ChatGPT, give me a summary of the, of, of the New Yorker article about the Ukraine, and it takes you straight to the summary, bypassing the whole New Yorker page. So this is, a, this is a, an existential problem for media businesses, which which companies like Google and the publishing industry, particularly in the US, are working very hard on now, but there needs to be a resolution. And Albert, just to move into where ideas do come from, great ideas, yeah. uh, maybe a show of hands in the room, who has used ChatGPT or Bard in the last several months to, oh, there we go, <laughs> elicit some good ideas. That's fascinating. Where do good ideas come from where you see them? Uh, Good ideas come from multiple sources. In the book, I, I, I really divide them into two categories, ideas that come from the inside and ideas that come from the outside. And the ones that are on the inside are, are, are really to do with the way we um, pay more attention to our imaginations, how we, we capture those moments, what I call the spaces in between, where the obvious ones being when you're on a walk or in the shower. These, these are moments when you disengage from, from your normal life and, and, and ideas flood in. And there are lots of stories in the book which I go into about peculiar 
habits of great artists and writers. And Schiller used to keep a drawer of rotten apples in his study. And when he was seeking inspiration, he'd open the drawer and take no, a deep breath. No, you actually breath. tried this. Can you tell and us I, how that went for you? Yes, I tried it when I was writing the book. <laughs> I, bought, I bought a bag of apples and I let them rot under my desk. And, and after about two months, I took them out and I took a deep breath and breathed right in. This, this gas called ethylene, which, which it emits when it rots. And I have to say, I felt very, very ill, and I had to go straight outside. <laughs> but um, for Schiller, it worked. And for Tegenev, he used to write books with his feet in a bowl of hot water. And for Nabokov, he'd sit in a parked car at the end of a journey, finding this was a, a moment of great inspiration for him. So there was lots of peculiar habits that people find. And uh, Wordsworth and Diderot both used to find that when you leave a party or leave a gathering where you've been very, very intensely involved, involved in a conversation, you leave and you're on your own and suddenly your mind is loosened and you're freed and these ideas come flooding in and that's where we get the expression l'esprit de l'escalier, where Diderot, the, the clever retort that he wished he'd thought of in time, only comes to him when he's leaving, leaving the party. So there are all sorts of examples like that. I find for me that one of the best moments for me to have ideas is when I as soon as I wake up in the morning, the waking moment, you go, instead of the, the fatal thing to do is to check your email or to check the news. Once you've done, once you've done that, you're, 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 it's, it's over, this, this precious moment. If you can carve out an hour first thing in the morning and you can just be on your own with a cup of coffee, this is, this is a very, very precious moment. And I think we just need to be more, more conscious and more systematic about where these ideas are generated and how we have them. And that's... And then there are other ideas, there are other things like being the, being the, the, the virtue of being a beginner, having a beginner's mindset, and this is quite a familiar trait, but I think what happens in life, particularly as you get on in life, is you become very fixed in your thinking, and as, as William James would say, the, the, the mind tends to form its worldview at the age of about 30, and after that you're pretty much set. So how do we counter that? How do we find ways of, of, of keeping ourselves fresh, and how do we, what do we learn from the great thinkers and uh, scientists of the, uh, of the past. And scientists are a good example because the, great, the, the greatest scientists, if you look at Nobel Prize winners in science, they had a disproportionate interest in the arts. And so if you take someone like Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin, he was also an artist. He was a member of the Chelsea Arts Club. He painted very badly. But nonetheless, this art was a way of keeping his brain, his mind fresh, his mind open to ideas. And the same with Einstein and the violin and... Uh, there are lots of other examples of, of, these, art, of these scientists who, who kept themselves humble in a way. And I think if we can all find a way of doing that in our lives, whether it's painting or writing or doing something that just sits outside of our, of our comfort zone, that, that I think is a very powerful effect that we can, we can induce into our own day-to-day -day life, which will, will, will stimulate the imagination. I'm excited to ask Will about his ritual, but what's so interesting about the young minds is that we just came from a panel discussing this very topic um, with some of the young, brilliant minds that we're having a conversation with uh, the more established voices, and a much smaller proportion of them actually raised their hands. And I don't mm. know if that's because they were shy in front of um, the professors in the room and the uh, organizers, but I think that's very interesting in terms of the ritual. Balthus's coffee comes to mind. Yes. some more aggressive substances from other creators <laughs> um, that we may have read about. But and, there all, and there are all sorts of external factors, how we design cities, how we design streets, how we design offices. How the, the, the cult of the coffee shop in the, in the 18th century was an enormous uh, boost to the imagination collectively, which, which really changed the world. How do we, how do we make those things happen in a, in, in a systematic way is, is a question that I, I ask. And I think of Jane Jacobs' sidewalk. Yes. And the exactly. Barbican, where you're currently at, you've interviewed so many authors, you are an author, so many artists. Rituals, Will, can you give us some insights like Albert has on that? Oh, well, personally, I, I, it's guilt. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm really comfortable taking money off the publisher. And then I, I'm, I'm writing the real bind. So, um, so and you get into all sorts of things like washing up and darning and stuff. <laughs> So it's procrastination like, and guilt. It's massive procrastination until they shame you into writing something. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so and I think that in truth that is the case that, you know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, mother and necessity and invention, all that sort of stuff. So I, I, I think there is a, a part of, um, an in, there is an imperative for an idea. I, and I think there is no such thing as an original idea. All ideas have origins. And I think there's a guy, an American psychologist called Albert, Albert Rosenberg, who wrote a really good essay on this. And he, he talked about homospatial thinking, about how ideas, how ideas happen. And you basically, you, know, you take something old, 
you respond to something, you clash it together with something new, and it goes through your own spirit, your own soul, and out, out comes something fresh. And so a really good example, I suppose, is the encyclopedia. You know, for hundreds of years, it was um, written by one person for the masses. Along comes digital media, Google, something different, clashes with something old, and a new idea, which is a new encyclopedia called Wikipedia, which is made by everybody for a single person. So it's, a, it's, it's the same thing, it's just a different iteration. And so there is, so I think we get obsessed with this, you know, <laughs> you know, do you sort of work and stuff when people get out and you know, have brainstorming sessions and all that? It's absolute bullshit, you know, it's <laughs> a complete waste of time. Nobody's going to come up with a good idea in that environment. So I think that it has to be an element of necessity, it has to be an element of deep knowledge. So, so ideas come from uh, uh, clever people, and uh, people have bothered to take time to really understand and learn something, and then you start getting a response. So you, then you, you've learned something empirical, and then you're in the, uh, the world at large, and things start responding to that. And that's why you have the shower moment or the walk moment. But without, the, without having invested in real knowledge about something, mm. you're not going to have a brilliant idea either. Mm. So they're, they're not simple things. So the, brainstorm, the office brainstorm is just... Well, if the coffee's nice, it's great, I suppose. But otherwise, <laughs> it's a, but just I want to go back to the point about AI and the dangers of AI. And what, what I find sort of weird about it, which is why I asked, answered the first question as, yes, I think it's dangerous, is because it, what strikes me is for thousands of years, we as a species have been trying to free ourselves in myriad different ways, I know, settlements or whatever it might be, industrial revolution, getting machines to do stuff for us. And we now got to a, a, a position where we are like, so privileged and so free and yet now we're starting to give away our freedom, which is our intellectual freedom, to machines. Mm. And it's bizarre. So if you think about that whole thing with um, self-driving cars and, and the programming, which has to go to a self-driving car, you know, does it go left to kill the kids or does it go right to kill the old people? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd always say, you know, well, whatever. Um, <laughs> the... the, um, the you know, that, that's, that was our decision once upon a time. And we've sort of delegated that to a machine. And I find that deeply worrying. And we're doing it, and we're doing it, and we're fast asleep. Uh, and I find it hugely offensive when I'm on my iPhone. And, and I'd been having a conversation with a friend or somebody at work, and an advert relating to that conversation comes up on my iPhone. I find that a, a, a social threat and an invasion of privacy and a derogation of my, my rights as an individual. I think it's shocking. And, and yet, we, no, just think about it, it's like, oh, well, there's, a, you know, there's a thing for jeans <laughs> or something, or white trainers, or whatever it might be. And, it's, it, and we're just letting it happen. And that, to me, seems really strange. But then my dad was a doctor, and there's no doubt that, you know, for him to, to, to do correct diagnosis, if he, had, if he could lean into a database of a trillion different versions of that disease and all the different answers it came up with to help, help him save a life, and then AI can be absolutely brilliant. But it's ultimately just a massive database, it, a relational database, and it's as good as what, what you put in. I was reading, I was reading this, that there's a magazine, uh, the Oxford Review of Books. Do you see that in, 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 in the green room? And there's this woman's written about, her, her, she's got taken Eliza as her therapist, and Eliza is uh, an AI bot. And, and therefore only really can give you therapy about what it knows. And apparently it's had loads of male uh, customers. And all Eliza wants to do is, is, is shag this journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Every time she tries to change the conversation, Eliza brings it back to sex. So, 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 so... It's early days. It, so, so the thing is, you, you only get out what you put in. And, and well, yeah. to extend that... Yeah. in a uh, family-friendly manner. Yeah. Um, there has been a great controversy, of course, uh, which is so relevant to this forum, um, which is that The Atlantic published the 180,000 novelists whose work Meta had been using to train its AI seemingly without royalties or their permission. Uh, and I'd love to hear if anyone on the panel has a view about that. Well, it goes back to my point about media companies. It's the same issue with writers. I, there, there's, there hasn't been the dialogue. There hasn't been the, the, the preparation for this scenario. And these things have been let loose on the world. And the question that I have is, is really whether AI will be under the control of the, of the big tech companies, under the control of Google and, and, and Microsoft and so on, or will it be open source where it's, it's, it's un, unregulated, in a sense, and unfettered in its ability to, to, to plunder information? And what do we do about it? Mm. 
So I hope, you know, I gave a very long answer. Uh, I do appreciate in the beginning about all the things we're doing internally and together externally with publishers on AI. And um, so I just, I, I, all I can say is my boyfriend is one of those authors in the Atlantic article. He is livid, of course. He's a, he's a nonfiction writer. He wrote a book called uh, Silence. And he's also a book publisher. So, you know, he's really angry about it. Uh, now, it wasn't us. It was uh, <laughs> meta, I must say. But uh, <laughs> I, I hope we didn't do anything like that. But um, I think all I can say is we really care about getting this right. We're really working hard to get all this right. And uh, I hope we've been a good partner to yeah. you in showing our commitment and hard work to make sure we find solutions to this. And I love what I'm hearing also echoes um, Rick Rubin in his book, The Creative Act. I love what he said about the idea that the object isn't just to make art, it's to be in the inevitable state that makes art inevitable. And I think going back to some of those rituals, going back to some of those conditions, um, I'd love to actually just inquire as to which amazing feats of creative genius have struck you most recently. What have you seen? What have you read? What have you heard? that has actually really resonated with you in terms of being supremely imaginative or creative? The one that, the one that stuck with me this year has been Wolf Works, the, 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 the ballet at the Royal Opera, which for me was something that was really outstanding. And it, it, it had two, two people in it who, for me, are supremely imaginative current figures in, 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 in Wayne McGregor and in, in um, Max Richter. And... The, I mean, dance is not something I'm an expert on, but for me, the staging of it with the visuals and the meditation on time and memory and, and death was, was, was completely mesmerizing and, and really showed what dance can do over and above other mediums uh, as, as, as a form of imaginative endeavor. So for me, that's, that's, the, that's the piece that, that I've really loved this year. I think that goes to Will's point in terms of the intersections. J.G. Ballard said the places in between, the yes. Virginia Woolf, the literature, the Wayne McGregor, the Richter, uh, that confluence Completely. Uh, of different disciplines. Yes, and reimagining the old in, in, in the new, to, to your point about there's never anything completely new. This is reimagining the old in, 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 a, in a completely new way and seeing the work, Virginia Woolf's work, in a completely different way as well. There's another, I love a quote from Isadora Duncan. She said, if I could say it, I wouldn't have to dance it. And there's that, there's that thing that dance conveys something which, which words can never do. Will, the creative act, what have you seen that has deeply impressed you? Well, I think... Uh, it, uh, hmm. it, well, I just thought those two poets earlier, by the way. Did, was anybody there? They were just amazing. Um, but the... Uh, I, I quite like that, the, that, the Foster Wallace um, sort of anecdote, which he, he gave at some commencement speech, I think it was 2005, we talked about the, the two young fish and, he's, and the two, and it's, it's, it's to a bunch of liberal arts students who are graduating and, and so, so had been taught critical thinking to the sort of the nth degree and he said, you, I, I bet you really very rarely engage in critical thinking. And he had this anecdote about two young fish swimming along on a warm day and they're going that way and then a big older fish swims the other way and says, morning boys, how's the water? <laughs> And the older fish goes swimming off that way, and two younger fish go swimming that way. And uh, one of the young fish then turns around to the other young fish and says, what the hell's water? <laughs> <laughs> and and like, we, most of us spend our life like that, and, and, and not really sort of engaging in the world around us, and just assuming and presuming. And there's this amazing artist in Chicago called Theaster Gates. And, um, and the way he's used his imagination muscle, the way is, is, is quite extraordinary. So he was, he was uh, he's a, he's a, a, an African-American, brought up in sh Chicago. His parents were quite poor. His dad retired roofs. His mum was a primary school teacher. He, had, he was a ninth child. He had eight older sisters. So somebody wanted a boy, I guess. <laughs> and, um, and he went to college and he went, taught at the university. At university, he taught town planning. And he liked to make, um, and he liked to do pottery. And at, at weekends, sometimes he'd sell his pottery. And he'd sell like a plate for $5 and a bowl for $4. And people would, um, people would barter with him and that made him frustrated so he said I made it with my hands and my head and my heart and I'd rather give it away and, and um, so he set up this exhibition of his pottery this is where he got creative right because the pottery isn't terribly good um, and um, you know it's been whatever and, and so he set up an exhibition in a, in a, a space in Chicago not, dif not dissimilar to the size of his stage 
and he had a display, and he had, a, a, he had an exhibition of all, all his pottery. Um, but he didn't say it was by Theaster Gates. He said it was by. Um, he said it was by. Uh, um, uh, uh, oh, uh, who is it? Uh, so- Soji Yamamoto, and so- and and that was a conflation of two two names, which was Soji Hamada, who was a great ceramicist, and Yamamoto was area in Japan. He put those two names together and figured the Americans would never work it out. <laughs> with Fiona, weirdly, they never did. And, uh, <laughs> and then, Canadians. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then so, 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 so yeah, Moto, he had this backstory that he was this great Japanese master, and he'd come to work with the black clay of Mississippi, and uh, he'd fallen off, in love with an African-American woman. He, he, she took her back to Japan, to the village he was born, to show her work, blah, blah. Anyway, he died in a car crash. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and so there's this show of all Theaster's works by Soji Yamauchi, yeah, uh, 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 and, and every single work sells. Every single work sells, and uh, in, a, in, a, in, in, in like two hours, and, and there's not a dime off any of it, and he doesn't sell it for three or four hundred quid. Three or four dollars, he says it's three or four hundred dollars each item. And with that money, he buys this old rundown shack on the south side of Chicago, and, which is a, a poor area of Chicago, and he, and he does what's called a gut rehab. So all the stuff he starts taking out, which is kind of crap, we would put in a skip. He decides they, all these objects hold stories, they have value. They, they're important. So he starts putting them into formal arrangements, like he gets an old fire hose and he puts it, and he creates a, a, a and he make, he just wrap, wrap. From wi- the Alabama riots. Yeah, he <laughs> winds it up and then he puts some um, stuff around it, some, uh, um, some balustrading to make it look like a picture, and he sells it, this old fire hose, for $150. Thousand dollars. Uh, <laughs> I, I think he does it again and again. He, can't, he says, "I can't believe how wet rich folks get about this stuff." Uh, and he s- does it again, and he keeps on doing gut rehabs, going through the south side of Chicago, and um, and then each place he does, he does it up and gives it back to the community for, for music, for books, for filmmaking, uh, uh, to celebrate black culture. Uh, and he's doing. A, he's not even good at pottery, right? And, and he's changing that whole place through an act a huge act of the creative imagination of a human being. One person changing an entire neighborhood through his imagination is an extraordinary act of creativity, I think. Great story. Jan should try to top that. No (laughs) way, no way, thanks. I thought you'd skip me on this one. I mean, I'm the geek, I'm just, first of all, I'm just fascinated by these examples and how different we think and, and I'm gonna be the geek again, so. What really fascinates me is um, something, it has scale. It's what my friend and colleague, Demis Hassabis, who founded DeepMind, he just did something that hasn't been, it's been in the press, but it's not been mega news, I think. But to me, it's just mind boggling. Um, There are 200 million proteins in the world and unfolding them, it takes one PhD student, a whole PhD, to unfold one protein. Why is it important to unfold? If we can unfold all proteins, there'd be great scientific discovery uh, for many diseases. And basically, his team used their AI to unfold all the, uh, the proteins out there. And that's not the, that is exciting, but what's exciting is there are 300,000 biologists using uh, this information, mm-hmm. and it's already leading to some great discoveries. And that's science at digital speed. So while the speed of things does worry me as well, it also like, if you consider drug discovery, how long it takes, this, this enablement of scientific discovery at digital speed at such scale, 300,000 is all the biologists in the world, by the way. You know, that, those kinds of creative acts really, really excite me. It's interesting also, I guess, Mustafa Suleiman, who yeah. back in the day was Demis' yeah. co-founder, yeah. Uh, the book that he has recently written that he's promoting that is also um, incredibly optimistic about AI in the face of uh, science. Uh, I guess back to the arts for a moment, Will, the book, see what you're missing, how to think more like an artist, not necessarily a scientist. Any top tips for this audience, apart from not using the phone for that first hour a day? not putting too many apples in your drawer. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the top suggestions? Well, we have, we have artists crowd? in our, esteemed artists in our audience who could answer that question better than me. Mark but Quinn, 5 p.m. The panel yeah. will be marvelous. <laughs> Very good. So, so, the, I, so, so I, I wanted to write a book about perception. Um, and as we've already established, I took the money off Penguin very happily. 
without really knowing what I was going to write. And uh, I got to a, quite a bad situation. I mean, they're extremely lovely people, but it was eventually, after five years, his only chance of, you know, a chapter. And, and I didn't know what to write. And so I, I, I did a bargain. I said I wouldn't go out at all. As long as, as long as, you know, I wouldn't go out and do other things until I started. I at least sent, a, you know, a bloody treatment or something. And, and I just had no idea. And I, that, I got a call that day from a chap called Tom Harvey, who um, what, was doing a, 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 a festival of creativity or something in Soho, and would I come and do a talk? And I said, Tom, I'm, I'd love to, but I really can't, because I've, done, I've promised my publisher I'm going to write a book about perception, but I have literally no idea what to write. Um, and, then the, and he said, fair enough, he was very charming. And the next day, he sent me an email and said, dear Will, I've been thinking about you during the night, which is unusual, to be honest. But, but, yeah. <laughs> Not even my wife thinks about me during the night. And, um, and, um, and uh, he said, and, and, um, and, and with it, he, he sent a picture of his dad, a chap called uh, Mark Harvey, who was a very good sculptor and taught lots of contemporary sculptures like Anthony Gormley. And, and he said, um, we live near the sea. And there's a picture of his dad and then young Tom as a two or three-year-old. It's in the book. And, and um, he said, every day we'd walk on the shingle of the beach uh, and Dad would find these most beautiful uh, pebbles and shells uh, and, and he'd show them to me and they were so exquisite. And then one day I wanted to find the pebbles and shells so I said to Dad, could I go in front of him? And Dad said, yeah. So, he walked in, so he, Tom walked in front and he walked the length of the beach and found nothing. And he turned around his dad was holding two massive handfuls of beautiful pebbles and shells. And, and he, in the photograph is his dad standing, um, standing up, but looking bent double, looking down at the, sh at the shingle. And he said, this is dad in his beach stance, his beach stance. And he, and, and, and he would just stay in that stance until something came up and he saw the beauty in it. And then he'd pick it up and find it. And it was all about spending time and looking. As David Hockney says, we, looking is really hard. And we all think it's really easy, looking really hard. Uh, and, and it was brilliant. And that was it. it. I thought, that's the book. You know, let, you know, artists and how they look. And each, what makes us, what's so exciting being a human being is although we are largely the same, 99.9, .9, we all see the world slightly differently. And if, so if, if everyone was to, to sort of write two paragraphs on this room, no, nobody would write exactly the same words in exactly the same order with exactly the same punctuation. And it's that ability to see the world differently makes each one of us as individuals potentially so exciting. And if you can find that way of looking and find that way of seeing, suddenly the world opens up and you, have, you, you can feel it. It tingles in a way before it, see, it just seemed not obvious to you at all. So, uh, yeah, so 31 artists and over 2,000 years. And it's the great um, element of our lives that we, we, we are probably missing and throwing away through screens, not paying attention to the world around us, not looking up, not, mm. not, not observing the detail of life, which is so much the fodder of artists, as you're saying, and I, I, I write about Turner strapping himself to the mast and yeah. observing the storm and, and using then going back and painting it, having seen up close the, the raw elements of nature. And, and that's something we, we can learn from, I think. And, yeah, I said... Yeah. And we too often, observation now is, is, is filtered. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's chopped up and it's processed and it's, it's, it's put into charts and numbers and when we don't really always see the... What's, what's beyond the, 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 the interpretation of that data, of that, of that information, and that, do, you, that do you remember David Hockney did those, those really vivid paintings of Bridlington in northeast yeah. North Yorkshire? Uh, and there was a really high key, was, and, and, and I, said, I said to him, you know, you've kind of, they're lovely, David, almost, but you are looking at the world's rose-tinted glasses. And he said, no, I'm not. Uh, you just haven't properly looked. Uh, and it's Bridlington, right? It's freezing cold, and it's slate grey. We all know that. Uh, and, um, and so I went up there. I went to the same woods. And, and I did as he told, and I did look. And literally, this is completely true, Jana, over, over 20 minutes, all the things we'd been taught, that trees, you know, tre trees are brown, leaves are green, paths are muddy, actually, the, 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 those trees started turning a Hockney-esque purple. And the leaves started to have this iridescent quality, and the path turned into a mosaic. And he was right. And it was, it was a revelation, because I'd never looked and stopped. But you have to do exactly as, as Albert said. You, you have to stop. You just, and it's a crazy world we live in, makes stopping almost impossible. But you have to stop. And when you stop, you will see. I think the place that I'm led to is to uh, 
ask you when you stop to read what it is that you are reading, because I'm so grateful to the organizers of this festival for slowing things down in a sense and really right. celebrating the communal um, and vital uh, reading uh, that is the core of this festival today. And what Albert has said is that, of course, in order to shift perception, in order to be original, you should read what nobody else is reading. Yes. And so I'd love to hear from you how widely and wildly you are reading. What is on your bookshelf? Uh, well, I think if you read what everyone else is reading, you have the same thoughts as everybody else. This is a well-known thought. So if you, if, you, if you try and vary your reading and read across genres, interesting things will happen. And really, since I've been researching this book and writing this book, I, the, my attitude to reading has, has changed. And really, I, I've gone back, or at least I try to go back, to the way they used to read books in the Renaissance where, where, and, and, and beyond, where they would, they would read many books at the same time, and they would reread books, and they would, and they would write in the margins and, and, and write notes in commonplace books, and then reorder their thoughts in these commonplace books. And the commonplacing of thought, this sort of idea of reading and noting, what, what they were one thing. Reading wasn't just a thing. Reading and, reading and noting were, were, were an activity, a, a discrete activity in, in themselves. And this was a, 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 a new way of, for them, was a new way of reading. And it's, it's a way of reading I think we've lost. Now we read books sequentially. We read a chapter before we go to sleep at night, and then we finish the book. Everyone else is the fashionable book that everyone else is reading, and they've heard about at the Clifton Literary Festival. And, and um, I think there's a different way of doing it. And you, you, if you have this disparity of sources, you have different, you know, you're reading non-fiction, fiction, science, history, you get this sort of very valuable fermentation of the mind where, where things bubble up and, and you see it with people like um, Bill Gates who, who will go on reading holidays and they'll take 20 books with them from all sorts of different backgrounds and that, that will be a way for them to condense thought and to, to bring ideas clashing together out of which will, will, will um, come, one hopes, disruptive original thoughts. So, and the other thing that I'm, I'm conscious of in my own life is, is a sort of reading hierarchy. I feel we're all subconsciously drawn towards the, the, the frequency with which one medium imposes itself on you. So you start with Twitter, and then you, when you finish the Twitter, you go, to, you go to, the, to the website, and then you go to the weekly or monthly magazine, and then you go to the book. And, that, and you're slightly pushed in that way. To, 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 and, you, and so inevitably, the book doesn't get read. So I'm always trying to force myself to read books before I check social media. And that, that's something else that I, 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 I think about. In terms of the books I'm reading at the moment, well, I, 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 going back to the earlier point, I often reread the same books. I have a rotating group, a group of about sort of a dozen novels that I go back to once every five years. So, so a big chunk of what I'm reading is something that I've read before. But, I've, but, I, but going back to it is, 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 is an interesting experience. And I, some books I've read four or five times in my life. And there are the, many of them. Suspense is killing us. The, well, Just give us some many of them, the, the obvious ones, Tolstoy, Thomas Mann's Wood and Brooks. I, I read Orlando, I go back to again and again. So there are, there are books, Count of Monte Cristo, I, I adore, and I read that again and again. And so th that is something else that I, 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 I do. In terms of what I'm reading at the moment, I'm reading, um, I'm rereading a book called uh, Visual Thinking by Temple Grandin, which is a very, very interesting book about, how, about education and how we really teach children in completely the wrong way. And we teach children in a very verbal way when so many children think visually and in patterns. And that, for me, is, a, is an idea that really needs to be taken on board in, in, in the mainstream. Um, I'm reading, I'm starting to read The Beasting by Paul Murray, which is a favorite for the Booker Prize. Um, I want to read Amy Evanson's book about uh, psychological safety, the right kind of wrong, because I think that's a fascinating idea of, of Again, I refer to it in the book, imaginative risk and being brave and taking... I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt said, do one thing every day that scares you. And, I, and I've taken this and say, do one imaginative thing every day that scares you. Do something that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable, whether it's sketching the garden or writing a poem. Just see what happens. You know, the risks are quite low. But you, you'll find yourself find, discovering new things about the, way, about the way you think and the way you exist. And, and for me, that's something that... I'm interested in, and I'm also interested in, in the idea of it from a work perspective. If you're running a team, how do you make people feel brave enough to have ideas? How can a bad idea lead to a good idea? And how do you make sure that people feel able to, you know, young people in teams, and I'm sure you have this at Google, where, where people are, you know, open to, to speaking up. That for me is a, is a very interesting area. Before we turn to questions, Yancha Will, what are you reading at the moment? Um. I'm a sucker for the Russians, so uh, Dostoevsky's Idiot is my favorite. I read Seagull, Chekhov's Seagull, 
play in a play, very short, on audio. And um, I want to read David Deutsch's Fabric of Reality that Demis recommended me, but I'm not sure if I'll understand it. And I am reading Simon Seabag's uh, The World, both I bought it on audio and uh, hardback. Very expensive on audio, <laughs> but worth I it. I do think it's worth it. many worth tens it. of hours. It, it so is. It's good value uh, and, and for the journey. It's a brilliant audio and a brilliant read on families. So. Fantastic. And Will? I, what I recently read, which is complete, I thought I mentioned because it's pertinent to this conversation, is E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops, which is like a tiny novella. You could, you could, read, you could read it in an hour and a half. It's written in 1909, and it's scarily prescient. I mean, it's, 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 it's society lives underground and communicates only by machines, and it's like, oh, my God. That is totally now. It's extraordinary. It's worth really, the machine stops, really worth reading. Uh, and the other one is uh, my friend Laura Cummings' book, Thunderclap. Uh, Laura is the art, uh, art critic for um, The Observer. She is an amazing writer. Uh, and she, the way she weaves memoir and art into her stories in Thunderclap, sensational book. Now, in Ian Forrester's Room with a View, he said only connect. So I would love to connect with this audience and take any questions that we might have in these final 10 minutes. Starting with the hand up over there. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you know, with all this information that is fed to us, uh, both with AI and social media, how do we keep our originality? And sometimes I question if the things that I'm reading, um, for example, you mentioned how we can get to summaries without reading the books. There's always a point of view, somebody else's point of view. And how do I create without being enforced by all these ideas? And how do I keep my originality? I think originality is, 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 is something which one has to really penetrate the meaning of what originality is. So the, most, the, the most original works that one can think of, if one thinks of Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which was you know, the breakthrough moment in, in modern art and set the course for 20th century modernism, was deeply original at one level, but at the same time was pulling on many different sources um, from, from Iberian art to African art to, um, to Cezanne. And so I think one, one shouldn't get too hung up on originality. I, th I think one, one, I mean, there's a T.S. Eliot quote, I can't quite get, do the words, but where he says that a good, a good, a good artist is, has all the history of literature and writing embedded in their, in, their, in their mental soil already. So it's all there. And the question is, where does it lead for, for you as an individual? So I, I would say don't worry too much about originality and, and, really, and really find your own interpretation of, of bringing elements together. The, the thing that I believe in is that one has to create one's own imaginative palette. One has to be able to pull, have, you know, going back to read what no one else is reading, one thinks of someone like uh, the Emmanuel Miranda and Hamilton. That was something where he was pulling ideas from different sources in a way that nobody else had ever done. You know, he was pulling a, you know, rap and hip-hop together with a, with a dense biography of, a, of an obscure founding father, and nobody else had done that. And that, for me, is originality, but at the same time, He's playing to very conventional musical motifs and, you know, and, and very traditional ways of running a musical. So, so what is originality, I suppose, is the question I'd ask back to you. Wonderful question. Do we have others? Yes, here in the front row. I've got a very loud voice, so that's what I need my <laughs> <laughs> With regards to, I'm interested, as a writer myself, I'm interested in the idea that you can be influenced by sources that have come before you, and then you create something that is very much your own, but can be influenced by things that have come before. So AI right now, I understand, you could say to AI, could you write a paragraph in the style of Zadie Smith, and you'll get the AI trawling through what Zadie Smith has written and coming up with something that mirrors Zadie Smith. Is AI going to get to a point where it can take information from Zadie Smith and what comes before, but then create something of its own? Because that, I think, as a writer who I hope has ideas of my own, I find that quite scary. Yanja, will machines be able to mimic human originality? Just that small question for you. I think every answer I gave is about humans and technology and the ingenuity being in humans, really maximizing the use of that technology. I'll refer to Thomas Robb, Bertelsmann CEO, who had an FT op-ed about this. So I'm not an expert in this area. 
um, and I'm one of the sort of, with my boyfriend, you know, the people really worrying about this, um, he's thinking of this as an opportunity as well as a threat. So uh, I think, again, our job as Google is to work with you. For example, the, ima the words that come to my mind is, they th it, used, it needs to be able to use your work with your permission or whatever is publicly available. And it needs to be within your control. Those, the permission, control, and the laws need to come, the regulations need to come quite quickly. Those are the things um, that I thought of when you said that. It's an interesting moment when technology is asking for the regulation. That's what we've been seeing from America. It's very, yeah, what, yeah, American companies to ask for regulation is not very normal. But I think also, I think it's... Uh, I mean, it's Stephen uh, has a question. It's actually an interesting question, but because I think a machine can make an approximation of what you might do, and, and it, could, it could maybe even come up with an approximation of what you might do around something you hadn't thought of. But as a writer, as you well know, you don't know what you're going to write. You have no idea. And often it just comes through you, it's just channeled. So there's no way a machine can do that because you don't know. So if you don't know, the machine can't know because the machine only knows what you know. So relax. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Stephen, wherever Stephen might be, that looks like Stephen. Thank you very much uh, for expanding my imagination, all of you today. So thank you very much. Um, there's a neuroscience friend of mine who says that human creativity is about one of the fundamentals of it is the ability to err, to be different, to make mistakes, to the edge and the disruption is created by making mistakes. So the analogy would be, you know, you're a jazz musician, you play a bum note, you play another one, or, you know, the, the Beatles put a, a major chord when it should be a minor chord or whatever it might be, and that creates sort of creativity. So mistakes and error is a fundamental part of human creativity. Do you subscribe to that view at all? Big time. Yes. Like Google Glass, like we really messed it. We thought it was going to be so big. <laughs> and um, I remember like people at Google wearing this thing. You can see your emails. Why would I want to see my emails like on this tiny thing? But today, you know, it flipped on its head. It's got surgeons, you know, people who need to use it hands free and collaborate are using it. Um, so things that, you know, I think we're a big believer and we've had some very big public uh, as well as private flops. So. It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big believer of that. I think, I think intelligent failure is, is, is a vital part of the creative process, whether you're a writer or whether you're Thomas Edison or whether you're Amazon or Google. That's, it's part of, it's part of, the, part of the, the journey, and it's an essential part of the journey. If you don't make mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. I like that. Intelligent failure as the other side of the coin of dumb luck. <laughs> uh, other questions? How about... Way back there. Maybe we'll take three since we're down to some final moments and continue the conversation as our authors are signing their books. Mm -hmm. Like in a good museum, we're going to exit through the gift shop. <laughs> so um, I had one question. Um, there have been a number of people that have, from Warren Buffett to Henry Kissinger, who have compared AI to the A-bomb. And six months ago, there was the open letter with numerous scientists. And similarly, with the atomic bomb, there were numerous letters that were sent out to the US and uh, the UK governments uh, from the scientists warning about um, the effects of atomic weapons. And one in particular uh, was O.C. Brewster. And in his letter, he said that we as scientists, uh, when we're dealing with a technology that is so disruptive to humanity that we have no proprietary rights to that. So I'm just curious from the creative aspect and from the technology aspect, what are the implications of copyright for this? We'll take two more quick questions, we'll bundle them up, and then we'll get to our summation. So, right. Yes, please go ahead. Hello. However effective AI becomes, if we continue to value artistic expression from humans, I'm just wondering how we're going to be able to differentiate. How will we know if we buy a book that it is by a human, if that's what we want to experience? Wonderful question. And for the final question up here on the left. Yeah, having just come from the previous session on whether 
it's inevitable to have a, a Labour government. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of AI, isn't this an opportunity for us to be much more redistributive and very socially progressive um, in the distribution of knowledge and the production of knowledge and get rid of universities? In the last three minutes, <laughs> I would love to have any of you chime in on any of those three very important questions. I think the last, to answer the, uh, to give it a, a version of an answer to the last question, I think, I think an optimistic take on AI for the creative industries is that, is that AI is your, is your best research assistant, your best editor, your best technology partner, and you can achieve enormous amounts with the tools that AI give you. And if you work in something like special effects in film or if you work in video games, the asymmetry of AI means that you know, a person in their garage can produce something that can be a video game that, 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 that sells throughout the world. So I think the opportunities are enormous for, for, for people who use it in the right way. And I think one, doesn't, one shouldn't think that AI is going to take your job. I think one should think that somebody using AI effectively is going to take your job. That, 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 that is really the, 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 the mindset I think we have to, we have to, we have to think about. Well, does that extend to artists, or are there any other questions you'd like to tackle? Well, I was really interested in the, in the question that you raised about, you know, if it's by a human, we value it, and if it's by a machine, we kind of don't value it, because there might be some sort of insinuous undercurrent or manipulation of your brain going on. So that's kind of super disturbing, but if it's good. Uh, so, I don't know. I think that, you know, you can absolutely imagine. And we, we, artists have always done additions. They've always done Good artists copy, great artists steal. Right. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm a bit more relaxed about whether it's made by a human or whether it's made by a machine. It's just like, how do you respond to it? You have to have the confidence. And if, 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 you're, if you're loving Eliza, the AI bot who's a therapist, then go with it. As, as long as you know if it's a human or not, I think that's important, and that's where the well, world well, no, but even though, even though, when you well, write, if you when you're writing, you're writing, writing, writing nowadays, and and um, the app on the machine will change the sentence syntax because it doesn't, it doesn't. And you go, actually, do you know what? That, that is better. <laughs> uh, uh, and so there is, we we would be naive to think we are creating without enhancement already. And, and that enhances then going to increase, right? Sure. And if, we, but the best thing is to recognize it happens and accept it. I love that idea. Not woman, man, and, or machine, woman and man, and machine. And I just want to conclude by saying that on behalf of Chanel, it's been an incredible privilege to extend our century of cultural commitment with conversations such as these. Gabrielle Chanel herself said, one can never be too modern, and she was a rebel, she was a reader, I'm sure she would have loved to be in today's audience. So a tremendous thank you to our speakers for this incredibly imaginative conversation. Thank you.